we'll go ahead and get rolling. Uh, we have some introductions first, so folks can always join in and as we're going through those. Um, welcome. We're so glad to have you join us on this Friday at a super busy time of the year. I'm Evelyn Nelson. I'm a, psych uh, a psychologist uh, with the project and so glad to see the kickoff of managing the food allergies echo with Dr. Marissa Love. Um, we're gonna just have a few reminders. Um, I know we have some new and returning ECHO folks. Um, just letting you know up front, those sessions are being recorded um, and we'll be able then to share the content with you back afterwards. Um, your microphones have been muted. Um, please unmute or use the chat to talk. Uh, you can test out the chat by typing your name and, and school district so that we know who's on the call. Um, we appreciate you keeping your cameras on. I see you're already way ahead of us with that. So thank you. It really helps us build this community of learning. Um, to let you know, your, your completion certificates will be emailed. Um, again, that's helpful if you sign in with your first and last name. So we make sure we get those to you. So uh, with no further ado, let's get rolling. I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Marissa Love. I'm really fortunate to work with her as a colleague in KU Department of Pediatrics. She's an assistant professor of allergy and, and clinical immunology at KU Med Center. So let me hand it out off to Dr. Love. All right, wonderful. Thanks so much everyone for joining us. Um, and I'll kind of skip through the initial slides here, but um, I am uh, an allergist and immunologist by training. I'm also board certified in pediatrics uh, at the University of Kansas. I take care of both children and adults um, in our allergy and immunology clinics. I don't have any financial um, relationships with any of the manufacturers um, in regards to the commercial products we might be talking about today. And I'm not planning to discuss um, any investigative or unapproved use of a commercial product today. Um, and then um, this is just a information and recommendations involving um, clinical medicine. Uh, everything I'm talking about today is based on evidence-based medicine is currently accepted within the profession. Um, just as a reminder, um, about four weeks after our session, you'll get a um, email uh, requesting to show a post-lecture uh, demonstration video. And then at some point after the uh, lecture, you'll get some resources uh, and the slides as well emailed to you. And thank you, everyone. It seems like uh, everyone was ahead of the game and um, already submitted their video uh, prior to the lecture. Um, so this is a two-part lecture series as part of a research study. Uh, the, teaches how to manage food-induced anaphylaxis and allergic reactions in the school setting. Uh, we're going to mostly focus on introduction to food allergies today, and then the second lecture will focus on recognition and management of food allergies. We hope that you'll gain more confidence in managing a food reaction, as well as increase your knowledge about food allergies and proficiency in the use of injectable epinephrine or an epinephrine auto-injector. Um, for each lecture, um, prior to each lecture, um, you will have been requested to fill out a kind of a demographic survey. I apologize, prior to today's lecture, you'll have been asked to fill out a demographic survey. And then prior to each lecture, you'll be asked to submit a video just demonstrating how to use an injectable epinephrine trainer or that trainer for the um, uh, EpiPen. Um, and the purpose of that is to see how much knowledge you've had retained over time. Uh, finally, after each lecture, about four weeks after each lecture, each participant will be asked to fill out a follow-up survey. And then again, another video of themselves showing how to use the injectable epinephrine trainer. Um, for every video submitted, you'll get a $15 electronic gift card that will be sent out. Okay. 
Um, and I might skip this one, um, but uh, important tidbits, every time you take a video of yourself showing how to use the epinephrine trainer, you'll need, of course, yourself. Um, and you'll need one of these, the trainer, um, and then the camera filming yourself um, and capturing where you're putting the trainer. So right now you can't see my, my legs, but uh, ideally the camera is um, focused on where you would put that epinephrine trainer, whether it be your arm, your thighs, your legs, you know, wherever it may be. Um, and if uh, for some reason you hadn't had a chance to do this already, um, uh, the Christy, our, um, one of our organizers may have already asked you to, to do this in one of the breakout rooms, but I think everyone's submitted this so far. Okay, let's get started. So um, in regards to objectives of today's lecture, um, Today, we're hoping to define uh, what a food allergy is, explain the difference between a food allergy versus food intolerance, identify the most common food allergens, and then talk about a little bit about how someone would develop a specific food allergy. And all of the information that will be presented in the lectures is actually um, a kind of summarized in a manual that we made for our food allergy patients. Um, so uh, you'll see some of the uh, artwork that we have from the manual throughout the lecture. Okay, so what is a food allergy? Uh, so basically this is an abnormal response to a certain food um, that is triggered by the body's immune system. Typically, the immune system protects against infection. However, with a food allergy, the immune system mistakes something in the food as harmful. And that harmful component is known as the allergen. So uh, in, in the clinic setting, we often say, you know, the food that you're allergic to is the food allergen. We're going to test you to the food allergen. Um, in practice, there's a lot of um, reactions that can be related to food, and some of them are intolerances and some of them are allergies. So uh, clinically, what we see is two, two various, um, two different kinds of categories, I think is the best way to put it. Um, an intolerance basically means that your body cannot break down the food for some reason. And often this will lead to GI symptoms, pain in your stomach, cramping, vomiting, or even diarrhea. However, these folks tend to do okay when they eat small amounts. Um, the classic example is lactose intolerance or folks who cannot tolerate cow's milk products very well. So they uh, will eat cheese or baked milk products just fine um, and have no issues with that. But then when they go to eat yogurt or ice cream that's based from cow's milk, or they go and um, have unprocessed or um, lightly processed cow's milk products, such as drinking cow's milk, they have the significant cramping, vomiting, and even immediate quick onset diarrhea. That is your classic example of an intolerance. On the other hand, um, allergies, as far as food allergies, this is where your body mistakes that food for something harmful and it triggers an allergic response, um, meaning that the immune system is involved. So the IgE is your allergy antibody and that's part of your immune system and it can trigger a local response or a systemic reaction. And this will be reproducible regardless of how much you eat, whether it's a small amount, you know, just a few milligrams of that particular protein versus a large amount. Um, it will be reproducible every single time that person eats it, um, no matter, uh, you know, how much they've eaten. And in some cases, um, the person may be so sensitive to the food allergen that when they inhale the powder um, or particle from that food, so for example, if there's ground peanut or peanut powder and it gets into the air and the person 
inhales it or gets part of those powders or, um, or dust on the mucosal surfaces, which would be the inside of your eye, the inside of your nose, the inside of your mouth, um, they can also trigger uh, an allergic reaction as well. So how do you develop um, a specific food allergy? So this requires at least two exposures. So um, specifically for food allergy, you need to have uh, an exposure for the first time where you have eaten the food and there may not be a reaction with the first exposure. But then what happens after the first exposure is that the body, the immune system will make those specific IgE allergy antibodies to the food allergen. And then every time you ingest the same food after that allergy antibody has been made, the immune system will respond. And so that's what makes the, um, the reproducible piece um, uh, very specific for food allergy. So um, that's, and that's why most people will say, well, I, I had a reaction on the second, third, or fourth exposure. It's typically not after the first exposure. There you go. Um, so virtually any food can elicit an IgE-mediated allergic reaction in a predisposed subject. And over 170 foods have been reported to be allergenic. Now that's a lot. <laughs> um, however, uh, there is eight types of food that account for more than 90% of allergic reactions in affected individuals. And that would be cow's milk, eggs, peanut, tree nuts, um, fish, shellfish, soy, and meat. And this is consistent with the finding that allergens belong to a very restricted number of protein families. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So again, the prevalence of food allergy, I'll start off on the right-hand side here. Um, the big eight allergens, which are the foods that I had just talked about, account for 90% of serious allergic reactions in the United States. And for um, the pediatric population, so children, six to eight percent of the general population that are kids have food allergies. In 2006, about 88 percent of schools had one or more students with a food allergy, a known diagnosed food allergy. So what about the general public, adults and kids? Um, so 2020, 20 to 25 percent of um, people believe that they have a food allergy that accounts uh, amounts to about 10 to 12 million Americans. There is some question about whether that's an overdiagnosed um, condition because when you go and have those people see an allergist and the allergist performs what's called an oral food challenge, and they react to that food during the oral food challenge, then the, the prevalence decreases to one to three to 0.5%. So for adults, it's one to one dash 3.5%. And then in infants and young children, it comes out to six dash 8%. Um, so there, there's, you know, again, looking at the confirmed allergies where the allergy antibody is the driving factor for their reaction, um, the prevalence is a little bit, quite a bit less than what the perception is by the public. Um, but it is very important to know that a, a wide majority of schools will have a food allergic patient and will need to learn how to manage these in school as well. So um, prevalence is higher in those with atopic diseases. So what are atopic diseases? Um, these are the classic allergic conditions that um, we'll typically see. So allergic asthma um, or asthma in general, 
eczema, which is a type of uh, rash and skin condition uh, that occur occurs in early childhood but can persist into adulthood. And then allergic rhinitis or allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. This is fancy names for hay fever or seasonal allergies um, that are typical conditions that would make the person at higher risk of developing a food allergy. And the prevalence of these seems to be increasing for all of the conditions. So um, all of the atopic conditions seems to be increasing amongst our general public. Um, food allergy has been increasing over time as well as uh, seasonal allergies and asthma. So a closer look at this, so there was a um, US CDC data brief um, in 2013, and among zero to 17 year old patients, the prevalence of food allergies had increased from 3.6% back in 2001 to 2002, all the way to 5.1% to two in 2009 and 2011. And as I had mentioned earlier, we're sitting around 6 to 8% currently. So over time, um, food allergies have started to increase. There are some theories as to why um, food allergies has been rapidly increasing. Um, one um, theory has been the um, hygiene hypothesis, you know, we're living in a more sterile environment um, compared to folks who had grown up in um, older generations than us. Um, and then there's also the uh, advancement of medicine. So there may have been food allergies 50, 60 years ago, but, you know, there wasn't the um, medical tool to diagnose it. So when do food allergies develop? At what age? Um, really, it can develop at any age. Um, most often, it's going to be between zero to five years old. Uh, the peak prevalence for food allergy um, in the pediatric population is at one year old. It'll be about six to eight percent of that population. And then as the child uh, as ch children get older, um, the prevalence does fall, um, and in adults, um, it ends up stabilizing in, to about 3 to 4 percent. What are some other risk factors for development of food allergy? So in um, Animal studies, they found that genetic susceptibility is important, um, the way the gut digests certain um, enzymes, which is uh, pepsin digestion, um, gastrointestinal infections can play a role, malabsorption, the rate of the absorption in the gut, um, how the immune system processes antigens like a food allergen, and then the nature and the dose apologize for this acronym here, um, nature and the dose of the antigen or food allergen can play a role in animal studies. Um, and as far as the host, meaning the, the human or the patient, um, those factors can include age. So babies can be susceptible for food allergy or development of food allergy. Um, genetic susceptibility, so you might see that um, a lot of allergic condi conditions tend to run in families. Um, so again, family history of atopic conditions, the seasonal allergies, asthma, eczema. If there's a family history of food allergy that can definitely contribute. Um, if the patient has what's called eczema and the, the fancy medical name for it would be um, atopic dermatitis. Sometimes this can be the very first sign of um, a food allergic condition. Um, sometimes these patients will first present with eczema. Um, asthma is another condition that can predispose. And then um, especially related to patients with eczema, if there's um, food exposure, initial food exposure through skin, so skin contact first before they have a chance to actually eat it and um, digest it, that can also contribute to food allergies. 
What are some risk factors for U.S. residents? Um, so this was actually kind of an interesting study. So um, there's foods, so food sensitization um, in patients less than 21 years of age uh, was related to um, being born in or outside of the United States and related to the age of immigration. And so when they looked at this a little bit closer, you had a greater risk of developing a food allergy if you were born in the US. Your odds ratio was uh, 2.05 compared to um, folks not born in the US. And then of the patients that were born outside of the US, if they moved to the US before they were age two, that was also a risk factor. And you can see that the odds ratio was even higher. They had a higher um, likelihood of developing a food allergy than their, um, uh, than other children who were moving to the US after age two. Um, and that was 2.68. Um, and in this study, they did see that still people who were born in the US, uh, but were children of immigrants, those also had a higher risk of developing a food allergy. So it suggests that there's some type of um, relative environmental risk factor for US residents, but there's a complex interaction between the genetics and the environment. Again, just to review, what are the most common allergens? So top three, um, you're looking at um, actually cow's milk, eggs, and peanut. Um, and then top eight um, are the four here, or the, excuse me, the eight here. <laughs> cow's milk, peanuts, wheat, eggs, fish. Um, and when we talk about fish, we talk about thin fish and we separate that from shellfish. Um, soy, um, so soy uh, obviously common in a lot of Asian foods, but also um, some more people that are vegetarian or vegan are starting to eat tofu and soy-based products, soy milk. Um, tree nuts, this would include almonds, Brazil nut, cashew, hazelnut. Um, an example would be Nutella um, is a hazelnut-based product, uh, pecan, pistachio, walnut, macadamia nut, um, those fall under the tree nuts um, as well. Shellfish, we often talk about the differences between crustaceans versus mollusks. So crab, lobster, shrimp fall under crustaceans, um, and your mollusks would be clams, um, oysters, mussels, scallops, your bivalve um, type of shellfish. Again, the big eight allergens. So these eight categories here account for 90% of the serious allergic reactions in the US. So when we look at this a little bit closer, um, which food has takes the top? Um, it's really gonna be cow's milk in the pediatric population. The estimated prevalence is about 2.5%. Um, and then if you look on the adult um, column, um, crustaceans tends to be on the higher side. So crustaceans uh, or shellfish allergy tends to persist in the adult population. Um, but, but yeah, the, these are all the top eight um, for food allergies. Okay. So um, what are allergens? Um, so these are proteins or glycoproteins, which basically means a sugar protein. Um, and these are structures um, inside the food or a component of the food that's generally heat resistant and acid stable. Um, meaning that for the most part for these foods, even if you cooked it or baked it, um, they would still potentially have an allergic reaction if they're allergic to that food. There are a couple exceptions to this um, that we'll get into on uh, the second lecture, but for the most part, you, you can trust that the, the allergenic proteins are heat resistant and acid stable. Um, and then this was just kind of a recap of um, the major allergenic foods. 
Uh, for adults, like I had mentioned earlier, shellfish is a big one for them, but also peanuts and tree nuts are some of the childhood food allergies that also persist into adulthood. Um, so this uh, slide is really just looking at food allergens of animal, by, of animal origin by family. Um, so uh, trochomycins is the food allergen or the protein component. That's the major allergen in crustaceans and mollusks, so your shellfish. Again, very heat stable and cross reactive. So what does that mean? So if you're allergic to crab, um, there's a good chance that you wouldn't be able to tolerate crab, lobster, shrimp. Um, if you are allergic to scallop, um, which is a mollusk, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to tolerate scallop, mussels, oysters, um, clams. Um, interestingly, the if one person is only allergic to mollusks and they're not allergic to crustaceans, um, that tends to be the case. You tend to stay in that specific um, category and you may be able to tolerate the, the opposite category. So um, again, just if you're allergic to crustaceans, most likely you can not eat um, crustaceans, but be okay with mollusks and then vice versa. Um, okay, so then for fish, the major allergen protein is called the parvalbumins or um, this EF hand proteins. Um, and it's uh, the main component for fish and, and frogs if you eat frogs. <laughs> um, and then finally for um, milk, um, the major protein is caseins. And this actually um, is very cross-reactive with other mammalian milks. So I had this come up the other day where a patient asked me, well, if I can't eat cow's milk, can I have goat's milk and sheep's milk? Um, and technically, no, um, there is uh, the, the allergenic protein. When you break it down and look at the details of it, it's very similar to other mammalian milks. And so there's a lot of cross reactivity there. And so it would be in the best interest of the patient to also avoid goat's milk and sheep's milk. Um, and you know this doesn't come up very often in the US, but in European countries, they would also need to avoid other mammalian milks like horse milk, donkey milk, camel milk, um, et cetera. Um, so what's the natural history of these food allergies? So fortunately, um, many of the food allergies in childhood typically resolve. So 75% of children will outgrow a cow's milk allergy. Um, and by age three, 80% of a cow's milk, soy, egg, and wheat allergy will typically resolve. So many times, you know, the patients that are going into elementary school, they may, they may have had a history of milk, egg, or wheat, or soy allergy, but it had dissolved by the time they get to elementary school. The ones that really do tend to persist tend to be the peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Um, only about 25% of children will actually grow, outgrow their peanut or tree nut allergies. And so this tends to persist through elementary school, high school, college, and into adulthood. Um, there is some evidence that resolution rates have slowed for allergies. Um, so typically the ones that would have been commonly outgrown, such as milk, egg, wheat, and soy, um, the resolution rate for that is slowing down, meaning that some patients are tending to retain their cow's milk, egg, wheat, and soy allergy with time. Um, and this was just an example of um, one study that showed how soy allergy resolves over the course of uh, the patient's age. So what are some good prognostic factors for um, predicting if someone's gonna lose their, their food allergy? Um, so this is where the allergist um, can be very helpful in that patient's management. So allergy skin prick testing, 
if it's a, a smaller skin prick test or they have lower blood levels for the IgE allergy antibody specific to that food, that's a reassuring prognostic factor. If they've not eaten the food in more than two years, that can be very helpful in making their allergy antibodies go down and over time. If their initial reaction was mild, um, so maybe they only had a rash and they didn't have anything else and it was a very mild rash, um, that could be a good prognostic factor. And then if they don't have any other atopic disease, so no uh, asthma, no allergies, seasonal allergies, no other food allergies, um, that can be a good prognostic factor. Um, interestingly, you know, we, we help patients um, just determine if they've lost their food allergy over time. And if they have, there's always the question of, well, is there a chance that I could develop the same food allergy again in the future? And so far, studies have shown that the answer is pretty rare for a redevelopment of the same food allergy. Um, however, it has become standard of practice to recommend that once you pass a food challenge, uh, for example, if you're previously peanut allergic and you pass a peanut challenge, um, the, the recommendation is to regularly eat peanut going forward. And for most people, this means two to three times per week. Um, poor prognostic factors. So basically, if they had a very high allergy antibody level, that IgE specific level to the food early on, that carries a poor prognosis um, compared to the lower values. Um, and then interestingly, most patients are allergic only to one food. It's not as common to be allergic to multiple foods um, in, the, in the classic sense of food-induced anaphylaxis. Um, so uh, this was just an example of one study that was done looking at um, 185 children and um, some of these children did have reactions to more than one food, um, but only 11% of the population had a reaction to more than one food. So, and you can see that um, in, their, in their cohort, um, there were only four people who had allergic reactions to four or more foods. So, you know, when, um, when you hear of someone that's avoiding three, four, five, ten 10 foods, um, th they really should be evaluated by an allergist because maybe only one or two of them are truly the anaphylactic severe allergic type of reaction. Okay. So why don't we all have food allergies? So fortunately, your gut, the gastrointestinal tract, is the largest immunologic organ in the body, and it works really well. Um, and it's constantly being attacked by many dietary proteins. Basically, anything you eat <laughs> has a dietary protein in it and the potential to become a food allergen. Um, but your gut is very, very good at doing what it needs to do as far as um, the immune system. And despite the extent of all that protein exposure from various foods, there's still you know, very few patients that have food allergies. So again, six to 8% of our um, pediatric population and three to 4% um, when looking at the adult population. Um, and we do know that there is a protective factor. So if the patient eats those food allergens um, early on in life, um, they, and they develop tolerance to that, that helps them prevent a food allergy down the road. So there's some good uh, literature that came out a few years back about early ingestion of peanuts in the newborn, or excuse me, in the infant population when it was time for them to start solids and it helped um, prevent development of a peanut allergy long-term. 
Okay, so a little bit about reactions. Um, so how do the reactions occur? Um, first, they have to ingest the allergen. That's the primary um, uh, mechanism for majority of the serious reactions. There's a few situations where breathing in the allergen can potentially cause an allergic reaction. And like I had uh, mentioned a while ago, um, the powdered form, so breathing in powdered milk or ground peanut dust or peanut powder is the typical way um, that someone might have an allergic reaction, especially if they're cow's milk allergic or peanut allergic. However, um, the big um, thing to note here is if that food product is in the room. So for example, there's a can of peanut butter in a jar um, in the room and it's capped, um, you know, that is unlikely to cause a reaction. They have to have some type of contact, whether they ingest it or the powder gets in the um, inside lining of the eyelids or in the mouth or in the nose um, to create a reaction. Um, another way a reaction can occur can be with cross-contamination. Um, and in the second lecture, we'll get into the details of this, but basically this is when the person's food comes in contact with their food allergen. You know, the classic example is you go out to eat at a restaurant and perhaps the same um, stove and um, cooking ware that they used was previously um, cooking something with peanuts in it and the person's peanut allergic. And then some people can get some reactions with skin contact. Um, typically, um, this will manifest as a rash, um, usually not a major player for a serious allergic reactions. What typically ends up happening is that the patient will come in contact with the, their food allergen. So for example, peanut butter, they get it on their hands and then say they don't wash their hands real well. And then the child is now touching their face, touching their mouth and you know touching their nose. And then that's when the severe allergic reaction will happen. So really, really very important if the person has come into contact with it with their skin to really wash their hands very well to limit the possibility of ingestion. Um, so reactions can be mild or it can be life-threatening. So what's a life-threatening uh, reaction? So this would be anaphylaxis. Um, again, we'll talk about this in great detail on the second lecture, but the way I explain anaphylaxis to my patients is basically you have to have two organ systems involved. So um, majority of allergic reactions due to food will always have some kind of skin manifestation, some kind of rash. So um, skin involvement plus trouble breathing or skin involvement plus vomiting, skin involvement plus um, throat closing symptoms, skin involvement plus swelling of the lip, swelling of the tongue. Um, those would be two organ systems involved. Um, and that would qualify as anaphylaxis. Um, the number one cause of anaphylaxis in the emergency department is food induced. And um, anaphylaxis can be very rapid in onset. So what does that mean? Um, within 30 to 60 minutes of food ingestion. Um, occasionally some people up to 30% of the reactions can have a biphasic episode. So they get their anaphylaxis episode within 30, 60 minutes of ingestion. And then two or three hours later, they get another episode, even though they haven't eaten it again, and they get another episode of um, anaphylaxis that would be called a biphasic reaction. Um, some of the allergic reactions can be localized to just one organ system, so they might just have a rash, um, or they can be generalized, which would be more consistent with the anaphylaxis. Um, Amongst the different foods, um, the ones that have a higher risk of developing anaphylaxis are going to be peanut, tree nuts, and seafood. And in the very young children, so we're talking about toddlers um, in preschool age or younger, um, cow's milk and egg can also cause anaphylaxis. So 
Uh, as far as the food allergy reactions, again, it should be within five to 30 minutes of ingestion typically. Um, it may be a little bit longer, but usually within the first hour of ingestion, um, they will have uh, start having symptoms. Uh, they can have skin manifestations, so that would be rashes, hives, um, swelling, or the other term for that would be angioedema, so you can have swelling in the lips, tongue, eyelids. They can get terrible nausea, vomiting, not just the single episode of vomiting, they're just you know, profuse vomiting. They can get immediate onset diarrhea. Um, they can have respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath, um, chest or throat tightness. A lot of people will, will say, um, I have this throat closing sensation and this you know, like impending doom type of um, uh, anxiety uh, when they have a anaphylaxis. Um, they can also develop dizziness, confusion, pass out with syncope. Um, and if you were to check, check your check their blood pressure at the time, hypotension, where it would be a low blood pressure. If a severe allergic reaction occurs, so um, if two or more organ systems are involved um, and the patient had concern of the uh, accidental food, allerg uh, food ingestion, um, uh, food allergen ingestion, then um, epinephrine is really the first line therapy for anaphylaxis. Um, so epinephrine, so what does it look like? Um, there's a lot on the market now. Um, a long time ago, we only used to have EpiPen, which is this one um, in the top corner here. The yellow is the adult dose, is 0 0.3 milligrams, and the green one is the junior dose, um, 0 0.15 milligrams. So depending on your student's age, you might have both the junior dose and um, the adult dose for your students. Um, in high school, a majority of the time, they'll be carrying around the, the adult dose. Um, so EpiPen is the one that's most widely used. Um, there are some generic EpiPens that look very similar to this um, and work the same way, and the dosing is the same. Um, there's also AdrenaClick, which um, is at the bottom here. Uh, I, I will not be showing how to demo this because it's not as commonly used, um, uh, at least uh, not in today's lecture. I'm not going to show how to demo this one. Um, I will say this is my least favorite um, type of epinephrine auto injector because it is confusing on how to use it. Um, and then the one that is um, new to the game is called AviQ. This has probably been out maybe two or three years now. Um, and it's really great. Um, it's automated and just uh, tells you what to do. You open it up and just starts talking to you. Um, and it's available in three different doses. The adult dose 0.3, which is the red one. Um, the 0.15 dose, which is the blue one, which is the same as the EpiPen Junior. And then it has an infant dose too, which is 0 0.1 uh, milligrams. Um, but these are some examples of what an epinephrine auto injector may look like. Each of these devices have a single dose in it. Um, and each of these devices, when they get mailed out to the patient, will come with um, two, sing two um, pens, each of which have a single dose, and then a trainer. And we always recommend that the patients always carry the two doses together at all times. Because if you use that first dose and it, you still are having symptoms five to 15 minutes later, you can use the second dose to buy you more time to get to the emergency room. So um, in regards to administration of the EpiPens, early recognition is very critical. And in the second lecture, we'll go into great depth on how to recognize this, um, uh, recognize anaphylaxis. Um, you want, to, anytime you're thinking about using epinephrine, 
if you've thought about it, I tell my patients, if you've thought about it, just go ahead and use it. You're not going to get faulted um, for uh, using a life-saving medication, especially if you're, you're thinking about whether or not to use it. Go ahead and use it for anaphylaxis um, or concern for anaphylaxis. And you want to give that first. You don't want to try to give your antihistamines or your steroids um, if you're suspecting anaphylaxis first, because that potentially would delay administration of the epinephrine. And there's some good literature showing that delayed doses of epinephrine lead to um, more morbidity and mortality. Um, and of course, uh, we counsel our families that all contacts around that person who's um, at risk for anaphylaxis should know how to use epinephrine auto injectors, um, and uh, it, and especially the patient themselves. <clears throat> 